Welcome back to our series on introductory statistics. I'm Mark Ledbetter and this is lecture video two. And in this video, we're going to finish up chapter two. First, let's review what we did last time. We talked about two types of studies. There are observational studies where the results are measured or recorded without any influence or um, interference. Then we have designs of experiments where subject matter experts and statisticians usually work together to set up an experiment that is controlled with different inputs in order to verify the change in outputs and thus they can prove or disprove cause and effect. Next we talked about some vocabulary that deals with data. The first word is individuals and these are the members of the population of interest or the population that we are studying. A variable is a quantity that changes. It doesn't stay the same. It varies. And these are usually the things that we're going to measure on the individuals. So it could be height, weight, length, um, temperature, etc. And we have two types of random samples that we will see in this course. The first is just simply a random sample. And it means that each individual in the population of interest has an equal chance or probability of being selected. A simple random sample says that for any group n of size n uh, individuals, every possible group of individuals of size n has exactly the same chance of being selected. The parameter versus statistics is an area or a topic where students often become uh, confused over the course of the semester, mainly because we talk about it now and then we don't use uh, this again together until near the end and there's been some space and they tend to forget that uh, what they've learned here in chapter one. So we have these characteristics that we want to know about. Let's say the mean, the median, the range, it could be the mode, standard deviation. There are many of them, but they are some characteristic. And usually we're interested in, in learning some information about the population characteristics, such as the population mean. If the mean that we're talking about is the population mean, then that is a parameter. And remember that P for population and P for parameter, they go together. However, I take a sample from the population and I can't calculate the mean of that sample. Well, that mean is the uh, sample statistic. Okay, So sample S, statistic S, they go together. So I can have a mean that's a population parameter. I can have a mean that's a sample statistic. Same thing with median. So that's where it's confusing. We're talking about the same type of quantity, an average, a mean, uh, or a median, or a range, or whatever we're wanting to know about. And there's a, one for the population, and there's one for the sample. If, it's, if we're talking about the value for the population, that's usually something we don't know, but we want to know about. That's a parameter. The value for the sample, we can calculate from the sample, and so we're going to use it to estimate the parameter. In this video, we're going to talk about some more basic vocabulary, specifically the types of data that we have and the levels of measurement. So there are two types of data, qualitative data and quantitative data. Qualitative data are simply categorical data, data that we can put into categories. In other words, they're, they're identified by labels only. We can't do anything else with them. Um, so we can use names, we can use numbers, but numbers uh, that won't be added or subtracted, such as phone numbers. It makes no sense to add or subtract or divide or multiply phone numbers. The same thing with zip codes. So they are placeholders or labels and nothing else. Whereas in quantitative data, uh, we do have numerical data and the values do act like regular numbers. We can add, subtract, etc. Discrete data is quantitative data that have gaps between the values. And what that means is, uh, let's take the example of a hen, a uh, female chicken. So that hen can lay between zero and seven eggs in one week under normal circumstances. She can't lay half of an egg or a third of an egg. 
she either lays an egg or she doesn't lay an egg. So there's a gap between um, zero and one egg, one and two, etc. And we can count these values. If they're discrete, then we can count them. It doesn't make them finite. There can be an infinite number of values. Uh, if we um, talked about um, uh, a hen and her future uh, prodigy, then that number of eggs laid by them and that family uh, could be infinite over you know an infinite amount of time, assuming that there's the legacy continues. Continuous data, there are no gaps between the values. And there's a proof that says that between the number 0 and 1, there are an infinite number of values. And also, there's a proof that says you can't count those values. They're uncountable. And so how I like to explain this is fairly simply, instead of using the uh, technical terms of the proof, which can be very involved, no matter how many decimal places you add to a value, say 0.5, and you have between 0.5 and 0.6, I can add another decimal place, and then I can go from 0 0.50 to 0.59. And then um, I can add another decimal place with another 10 possibilities, 0 to 9, and so forth. And I can just keep on doing that, and there's no way to count that. Okay, So continuous data has no gaps. So things such as time, temperature, pressure, uh, heat, these are continuous values. Levels of measurement. We've listed them from lowest to highest. Lowest being the least amount of information we can get from analysis. Highest being the most amount of information we can get from the analysis. Now, we cannot make um, nominal data more complex. Okay? So we can't change data from being nominal to ordinal. However, we can make data less complex. So I could take ratio data and uh, by grouping it into categories that are in order, I could make it ordinal. Or I could group even numbers and odd numbers, and so then I would make it all the way back to nominal. Just two different categories. You can say that one is higher than the other. Okay? So we can lose information or remove information from data, but we can never add information to data. So when you're asked for the highest level of measurement, give the level that uh, that data, uh, the highest level that that data can satisfy. All right. So nominal is just the measurement of qualitative data. And the only thing we can do there is to place that data into categories and then count. Ordinal data only tells you the order. So if you see in the newspaper the first five people who finished some uh, track event, say in high school, and they didn't put the times, and they just put first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc., then you know who came in first, who came in second, but you don't know how much of a difference there were between any of those people. You can only compare their relative standings, so to speak, uh, how they finished compared to the others. And then we have interval data. So interval data uh, is numeric, and the difference between values is meaningful. But a ratio of values is not meaningful. You might wonder when this is uh, so. There's not all that many different um, uh, examples. So I'm going to use one that we run across a lot, and that's survey data. If the question asks or states that um, the professor clearly explains the material, you're given a choice of strongly disagrees, disagrees, neutral, agrees, and strongly agree. And those are usually given numbers like 1 through 5. But there is no answer there that says that there is an absence of clear explanation by the professor. None of those mean that. So uh, it doesn't make sense to say a response of 4 is twice as high as a response of 2 in that case because there's no zero. Okay? So interval data does not have a natural zero. A natural zero is the absence of what is being measured. Okay? So where do we have natural zeros? Well, in most things that are numeric. But another interval uh, type of data 
is the temperature measured in Fahrenheit or Celsius, okay? Because zero Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, they are not the absence of heat, which is what temperature measures. So for Fahrenheit, it doesn't make sense for me to say today was uh, 80 degrees and yesterday was 40 degrees, so today is twice as hot as yesterday. That's not true because zero is not the absence of heat. And the same thing with Celsius. Now, um, if we use Kelvin, then we can use ratios because Kelvin has an absolute zero. Zero Kelvin is the absence of heat. But how many of us really understand or know off the top of our head what 300 degrees Kelvin versus 150 degrees Kelvin really is? Not many of us. Usually just scientists. Okay. So a ratio has a natural zero. And the zeros are mean, meaningful, the ratios are meaningful. What a natural zero says is that the, the zero value is the absence of what you're measuring. So if we're measuring the height of people, let's say men, then a zero height is the absence of height, it's also the absence of a person. So that is a ratio measurement. Let's do an example. Let's say that we're going to uh, study all the nurses working in Virginia and we want to know their average salary. So we randomly select 70 nurses and for each nurse we record their age, annual salary, the number of years of experience, uh, the number of years of post-secondary education, that's college, and the number of employers they've had and their uh, political affiliation. We're uh, told some averages and some the average uh, age and salary and the range of all the sample. Now, what is the population and what is the sample? The population, all the nurses working in Virginia. That's what we're interested in. The sample, the 70 nurses that were randomly selected. So there's several parameters and statistics we could list. I stuck with the purpose of the um, study, but you don't have to, there are others. So, and I said the parameter of interest <clears throat> is the average salary of all nurses working in Virginia. The statistic will be the average salary of the 70 nurses that were selected. Or you could put the actual value, and then I'd know that you know what a statistic is, $39,239. Now, five, I meant to put categorical data, but I could say nominally nominal measurement data, uh, so that would be the political affiliation. That's categorical data. <clears throat> you can't order it. You can't do anything with it. So it is nominal data. Now I want some quantitative data. I want discrete and continuous. Well, the only discrete data is the number of employers. <clears throat> you can't work for one and a half employers. It's either zero, one, two, etc. <clears throat> and you can count it. The, the rest of the values are continuous. Salary um, goes from zero to whatever, and even though you may think that pennies are um, uh, the smallest you can be paid, go to the gas station, you'll see that um, uh, money actually does have more than one or two decimal places. We just round it to that. And many of us have salaries that are rounded um, to the nearest um, penny or what have you. And then age is based on time. Age is continuous, so time is continuous. We may only record discrete amounts, but the underlying quantity, which is time, is continuous. And years experience, again, it's time, so that's continuous. So you say, well, it's, it's discrete because you can only have one or two, but as soon as I start working, I have less than one year of experience, but it's not zero. It's between 0 and 1, and time is continuous. So the same thing with post-secondary education. We only record it in whole numbers, but throughout the year, you are gaining that education, and it is increasing continuously. So what's some ratio data? Turns out that, in this case, all of the continuous data is also ratio data. Salary, 0 means the absence of salary. 0 age means the absence of age, also the absence of a person. Zero experience, don't have any. Zero post-it secondary education, none. So these are all natural zeros, and so the data is ratio. 
I hope this has helped explain these concepts and reviewed of uh, chapter one concepts so far. And please remember to turn in your notes so you're going to scan them and uh, post them to your Google Drive that I've shared with you. Uh, please make them neat. That's not for me. It's for you. You're the one that are going to be using uh, these notes. So you need to be able to read them and understand what's on them. You can use them for um, studying for tests, for doing the homework, etc. You may even want to use them on your projects. If you have questions, something wasn't clear, you need clarification, I welcome you at virtual office hours. If those times uh, don't work for you or you need help before then, by all means, uh, email me. I'm always happy to help. So beginning next time, you will want to start your formula sheet for the test. Okay, We're going to start doing some uh, calculations and some formulas. And so this will be helpful for you for doing your homework and for tests. So I hope to see you next time. 